Good morning, church. Are you excited to be here this morning? Amen. Hey, can you, for just one second, can you give God a shout of praise? Lift up your voice, clap your hands, be thankful this, this Thanksgiving season for what God has given us. If you're online in your living room, join us as we are in service this morning. Hey, would you stand with me this morning all across the room? Would you stand with me as we prepare to read from the Word of God? We're going to be reading in Matthew chapter 18. If you don't have your Bible, that's all right. You can follow along on the screens with us. It says this, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I? That was weak. Let's try it again. How many times shall I? There we go. My brother or sister who sins against me up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servant. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay the master, ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged. I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him, began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and began and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. Verse 35, this is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you, your brother or sister, from your heart. Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is true. I pray that you'd open up our hearts and our ears, that you'd speak something new to us, that we would learn to forgive, and, and we'd look at your example. Open up our ears, and here we pray, amen, amen. You may be seated. This morning, we're continuing our series on spiritual warfare, and we see that there is a spiritual war happening all around us. There's a war happening, all, do you recognize that, that there's a spiritual war happening all around us, and we're at war with the enemy. The enemy is Satan. And we kind of have a look at the enemy's playbook here, and we see that the enemy, his agenda is to destroy. We know the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy your relationships. He wants to destroy your relationship with God, and he does this by dividing. He divides you from other people. Why? Because it's easier to destroy you when you're on your own. So he divides you from others, he divides you from your family, he divides you from God, he divides you from your church, and he divides us by offenses, by us being offended by things. And that offense, it leads to unforgiveness, that offense leads to anger, to bitterness, to a critical spirit. He does that all through offense. Now understand, offenses are something that happen to you. You have no say over. It's going to happen. But being offended is a decision. It's your choice. I'm offended by what happened. And what's crazy to me is it seems like everyone, everywhere is offended by everything all the time. Have you noticed that? Like everyone is offended by everything. I'm offended. I'm offended by what you posted on social media. Like, I don't know about you, but I feel like I gotta pray for 10 minutes before I post anything on social media. Like, what's someone gonna think when I post his? I'm offended by what you posted. I'm offended you didn't like my post. You said happy birthday to them on Facebook, but not happy birthday to me on Facebook. I'm offended. I'm offended that you're wearing a mask. I'm offended you're not wearing a mask. All right, everyone's offended by everything. 
And what's crazy to me is it seems like Christians can be the most offended people on the planet. Which is ironic because our whole religion is about a relationship with someone who wiped every offense we ever committed against him. But we're offended. Everyone is offended by everything. How many of you know someone and they're just like, they get offended all the time. Don't point at them. <laughs> they might get offended. <laughs> but raise your hands, you know someone that just gets offended all the time, right? And maybe as you evaluate your life, you'd say, yeah, that's me. I get offended very easily. Like someone cuts you off in traffic, you have a horrible day. How dare they cut me off, right? You get offended by things all the time. And what happens is you probably find that you have a hard time staying happy. Can I encourage you this morning? If you wanna stay happy, don't be so offendable. We can't be offended. So how do we avoid being offended? It's simple. Here's the key to not being offended. If you're taking notes because note takers are world changers, write this down. The key to not being offended is love. Love is the key. Look at what Proverbs says. Hatred stirs up conflict, but love covers all wrongs. Love covers all offenses. We have to choose to love. You see, there's this dynamic that happens in every interaction we have with someone. This dynamic always happens. There's an action, someone does something, there's this gap, and then there's your reaction. So someone does something, a gap, and your reaction. That gap is your interpretation of that action. The problem is, we as humans are horrible interpreters. You know this because how many times has someone misinterpreted something that you said, right? And you say, I didn't, I didn't mean it like that. That's not my intentions, that's not, what I, that's not what I meant. We misinterpret it all the time. And it's this thing, I did my research this week, you're gonna like this one. It's called fundamental attribution error. Fundamental attribution error. And here's what fundamental attribution error is. It's this bias to which I attribute my actions to my circumstances, but I attribute your actions to your character. So I did this because, well, look at what was going on. You did that because you're a horrible person, right? We, we do this a lot. Someone texts me and I don't respond right away. Well, I couldn't respond right away because I got 15 text messages at the same time. I couldn't respond right away because I was, I was in the middle of something. My phone died. I didn't have great service. Or maybe you make the mistake I make all the time, and I write out my response, and I don't hit send, right? Anybody else with that struggle in the room, right? It's, it's not that I am a horrible person. It's just understand my circumstances. But you don't respond to me right away. You're a horrible friend. You don't care about what I just texted you. You're lazy. It's about your character. Or it's like this. Any parents in the room? Parents, right? You walk into the store with your toddler and as you're in the store, the toddler starts freaking out. They're screaming, they're throwing a fit, everyone is looking, right? You've probably been there before if you're a parent. And you're saying, no, you don't understand. They're teething right now. They didn't have a good night's sleep. They need a nap. They didn't eat a good lunch. They're normally not like this. There's circumstances, someone else comes in they're in the store and their kid's freaking out, saying, oh my goodness, what a lazy parent raising a demon-possessed terrorist. We need to protect ourselves. <laughs> you know it's true, right? Your actions is about your character. My actions, it's about my circumstances. And it leads to us being offended. Why? Because we don't see that it's their circumstances as well. So how do we fix that? How do we not be offended? It's by filling the gap with love. Because when I fill the gap with love, when I interpret their action with love, I say, that poor parent, they're probably doing everything they can. This must be so hard that, that they still have to continue to grocery shop with their kid freaking out. I'm just going to go ahead and buy their groceries. Oh, that person didn't text me back right away? That's right, they're probably so busy. I wonder if they need help with anything. I'm gonna text them and see if they need me to help out with anything that they're doing. We fill the gap with love. Love believes the best in other people. As we're looking at this 
topic of unforgiveness, we see that so often it's offenses that lead us to unforgiveness. And if we can learn to fill that gap, that interpretation with love, we're gonna be way less offended, meaning we'll have to forgive way less because you didn't hurt me in the first place. I understood your circumstances. So now that we know this is how I avoid being offended, I wanna look at three areas in which we need to forgive in our lives. Three areas that we need to forgive. And maybe some of you, like your jaws are, I can see like you're like, ah, oh, forgive? Ugh. I don't know if I can forgive. Or maybe you're thinking, I'll forgive when that person apologizes. Well, if you're thinking, I'm gonna forgive when they apologize, might I offer up that you have the wrong idea of what forgiveness is? You think forgiveness is all about justice. It's gotta be right, but forgiveness is not about justice. Forgiveness is all about freedom, and it's freedom for you. I think so many people, they hold on to this unforgiveness, and they, they hold on to this hurt, and they don't forgive that person because, oh, I'm gonna hurt them back. I'm gonna make sure that I don't forgive them. They're gonna be so hurt by this, but when you hold unforgiveness, you're not hurting the other person. You're only hurting you. I've heard it said before that unforgiveness is like drinking poison, hoping the other person dies. Not gonna work. Ah, oh, I hope this hurts you. Unforgiveness is just hurting you. Three areas that we can forgive in our life. And the first one is this, we need to forgive others. We need to forgive others. Who is it that has hurt you, that betrayed you, stabbed you in the back, lied to you, lied about you, that person you need to forgive. And here's why, forgiveness is so important. Look at what Matthew chapter six says about forgiveness. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But, uh-oh, if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. Yikes, what's that saying? If you don't forgive other people, you aren't gonna be forgiven. How many people in the room, just show of hands, how many people have sinned before? Anybody in the room sinned? Show of hands, look around, hold them up, look around. People that aren't raising their, raising their hands, they are sinners, they are lying right now. <laughs> Liars. All of us have sinned. We've all messed up, which means we all need forgiveness. We all need it. That's a fact. We need forgiveness. And we do not get forgiveness unless we give forgiveness. We need to learn to forgive. So what is forgiveness then? If I have to forgive, what exactly is forgiveness? Well, here's one thing that forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not fair. I think lots of people think, ah, it's gotta be fair. You hit me, I'm gonna hit you back. That's fair. But forgiveness isn't fair. And really that's something to be thankful for. Because when you think of all the sins that you've committed and God forgives you every single time, that's not fair. Our forgiveness towards other people isn't fair either. Here's what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is showing others what God gave us in Christ. It's giving others that grace. It's giving others that love. Have you as a Christian, have you as a follower of Jesus, a believer, received God's grace, received his forgiveness? If yes, which is everyone, then we need to give that grace and forgiveness to other people. It's what we have to do. We have to learn to forgive. I love in this, this passage we read at the beginning where Peter says, how many times should I forgive? Seven? Like, how did you get to the number seven? It makes me think he probably had someone that he had forgiven already six times, and he's just sick of that person. He's like, can I just one more time and then I'm done forgiving him, right? And Jesus' response is this, 77 times. Some versions might say seven times 70 times. What he's saying is this, is don't forgive someone 77 times or 490. He's not saying, here's a specific number. He's saying, don't keep count. Actually, you should lose count. The idea is we're supposed to lose count. When it comes to forgiveness, throw all your calculations out the window. Why, because so often we say, how much forgiveness do they deserve? But really the question should be is, how much freedom do you desire? It's not about what they deserve, it's about how much freedom 
you desire. We have to learn to forgive others. Number two, this is one that I haven't really heard much talked about in church before, but it's something that as I was preparing for this week that I really felt like was gonna be a breakthrough moment for some people this morning. And it's this, forgive God. Now technically, God doesn't need forgiven. He's never sinned. But what happens when you feel like God lets you down? What happens when you prayed for something and that prayer wasn't answered? Maybe it's a a situation like you have a close friend and she has a not so good boyfriend. She steps out in faith, she says, I feel like God's telling me I need to break up with this not so good boyfriend and in faith she steps out, breaks up with that boyfriend. And then three weeks later, in walks the most handsome, Channing Tatum built, kind, loving, has half the New Testament memorized, man of God. And three weeks later, they get engaged and win a free honeymoon. And there you are, broke up with your not so good boyfriend five years ago, and the only date you've been on since were with Ben and Jerry. And you're saying, seriously, God? Where are you right now? Or maybe you have a friend and, and they have a pet. They have this little dog, a little, little, little spot. And they say, oh, spot needs a miracle. Spot's really sick. And they pray for a miracle for spot. And my goodness, God does a miracle in that canine spot. But there you are. And you've been praying for that close relative, that friend, that grandparent, spouse, child, and you're praying and praying and praying that God would do a miracle and nothing happens. You say, seriously, God? You healed the dog, but not my spouse, not my, not my parent? Where are you? Maybe you've been praying and praying and praying for years and years and years. God, give me a child. You just can't get pregnant. And then you hear about some girl who just accidentally got pregnant they didn't want the baby, had an abortion. Say, seriously, God? Where are you? What do you do when you feel like God's left you? When you question, God, where are you? Can I encourage you for a moment? I can't tell you why he answers some things and doesn't answer others. I can't tell you why that relative passed away. I can't tell you why that thing happened, but can I just encourage you for a moment that we can take heart in knowing that God's ways are higher than our ways. And when we feel that way, when we feel broken and we feel like, God, where were you in this moment? Can I encourage you not to run from God, but come to God and say, God, I'm broken. God, I'm hurting. God, I feel like you've abandoned me, and, but I'm here. I'm coming to you still. Continue to come to God, even when you feel like God's hurt you. And then we say, God, I don't know why that happened, but I'm choosing to trust you. Forgiving God really is this. It's, it's trusting God. Saying, God, I I don't know why, but I'm choosing to trust in you. So number one, forgive others. Number two, forgive God. And number three, as as the worship team comes, might be the hardest one of all, and it's forgive myself. Forgive myself. Forgiving myself, you forgiving you, might be the hardest person for you to forgive. Forgive. Why, because you know exactly what you did. You know exactly what you said, what you didn't say, what you thought in that moment, and now you're stuck with this shame and with this guilt that comes from that thing. Maybe it was a night and you, you, you got drunk and you said some things that you shouldn't have said, you did some things that you wish you could undo. Maybe it was something from your early 20s or your teen years and you made a decision in a moment that you said, this is the right decision to make and you've regretted it ever since. Maybe in in just the the idea of I'm gonna be a good parent, you had kids and you said, I'm gonna make sure to provide for them. You had a a good plan and you just said, I'm gonna provide for them, but it turned into you working every single weekend, turned into you working every single night and you missed sporting events, you missed concerts and now the thing that you worked for is gone 
gone and you're saying, man, why did I do that? You're stuck with this guilt. You're stuck with this shame, with this regret. Maybe it's in your marriage. And you're at a point in your marriage where instead of stepping in and working things out, you stepped out of your marriage. You betrayed your spouse and now you're stuck with this shame or with this guilt. Maybe it's the constant clicking, the constant scrolling, the constant addiction to pornography. And really you do love God. And really if you're married, you do love your spouse, but you find yourself going back and back and back again and you are stuck in this place of shame. What do you do when what you did haunts you? I think it's important to acknowledge that not all guilt is the same. There's actually something that we would call a false guilt, and that would be something like this. Maybe as a, as a kid or as a teenager, your parents went through a divorce and you've blamed yourself for it. It's my fault that they got a divorce. That's a false guilt, it's not your fault. Or maybe there was a loved one, someone that was close to you that you trusted, and they took advantage of you. Maybe emotionally, maybe sexually. We see that so often the victim blames themselves. I deserve this, this was my fault. That's a false guilt and that's exactly what Satan wants. That's a way that he works in this spiritual warfare is giving you this false guilt, getting you stuck in this place of shame. You see, there's another type of guilt and it can actually, believe it or not, be a good guilt when you let it draw you closer to God and it leads us to repentance. Look at what 2 Corinthians says. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. There's a guilt that we feel, and sometimes we don't, we don't really like feeling guilty. We don't like it, but it can be a good thing when you let it draw you close to God. But Satan, he wants to always pervert and twist everything that God intended for good. We know this, this is his tactics. He, he tries to turn everything around. So he's come in and he's has, he has this false guilt or he has this worldly sorrow that is actually shame. You see, guilt is saying, I did something bad. Shame from Satan says, I am bad. And maybe now you're stuck in this place of shame and you're saying, you feel Satan lying to you saying, you're never gonna mount up to anything, you're useless, you're worthless, you'll never be a good parent, you'll never be a good spouse. That pain you're feeling, that's just punishment for your past. You have to go through it and you're stuck in this place of shame. And I'm telling you right now that repentance leads us to freedom. Repentance leads to forgiveness. That forgiveness leads to freedom. The hardest person to forgive might be yourself, but I wanna encourage you this morning that if we can learn to repent, we will find freedom in God. It's not about what's deserved, it's about how much freedom you desire. Would you stand with me all across the room this morning? Really this morning, there's, there's an action step for all of us, right? We, we started talking about being unoffendable this morning. And really as, as Christians, as believers, we should be the most unoffendable people on the planet. We should constantly be filling that gap with love, constantly be saying, oh, that person probably didn't intend that. Oh, that person didn't mean that. We're constantly filling it with love. And this morning, maybe your response is this, I wanna be unoffendable. I wanna be the most Christ-like person. I wanna be hope to people that wherever I'm at, they see me and they know that I am loved because I'm filling that gap with love. And maybe that's your response this morning saying, I wanna be unoffendable and, I, unoffendable and I hope that's all of us. But maybe your response this morning is this, is there's someone that's hurt you and your response this morning needs to be forgiving them. And in just a few minutes, moments, I'm gonna open up this altar for you to come forward and respond. And maybe you're responding saying, I, I need to forgive someone. Now let's talk about that for a moment. You coming forward to God saying, I need to forgive this person. That's not you forgiving that person. But the Bible talks about us going to that person and forgiving that person. Maybe the person's in the room and you can go forgive them. Maybe the person's sitting right next to you, you got in a fight on the car here and you need to forgive them. Maybe the person is gone. They're no longer on this world. And you're stuck with this unforgiveness. 
I would encourage you, maybe you need to write a letter, just putting it out there, releasing that forgiveness, finding freedom in that. We need to learn to forgive others. And I believe that there are some people in here this morning and you're hurt, you're not even sure why you're here because you're saying, God doesn't listen to my prayers, God doesn't hear me, he doesn't see me. And you have unforgiveness towards God. And this morning you need to come forward and say, God, I know you don't need my forgiveness, but I'm coming to you this morning saying, God, I'm learning to trust you. I'm learning to surrender to you. So this morning we're responding in a few different ways. Responding saying, I wanna be unoffendable. Responding saying, I need to forgive someone. Responding saying, I need to forgive God. And in just a moment, I'll come in and we'll walk through the last and final step of this forgiveness. I'm gonna pray, and as I say amen, if that's you and you wanna respond saying, I wanna be unoffendable, if you wanna respond, saying, I need to forgive someone, I need to forgive God. Or if you wanna respond coming forward, just saying, I just wanna have more of God. I just wanna, like we're gonna sing, I just wanna make room for him. I want him to speak to me. Maybe you just need to evaluate in your heart, God, where is there unforgiveness in your in my heart? And maybe God's gonna pull something out and you realize, yeah, I've never really forgiven that moment and God's gonna work through that. But can we just for a few moments this morning, can we just make room for God to move? So I'm gonna pray when I say amen, that's you can come forward and we're gonna respond to this. Jesus, we thank you for the price that you paid on the cross, the price for our forgiveness. God, I pray that that would be an example to us, that us as Christians, that we would forgive constantly, that we would forgive others, that we would forgive little offenses that come up, that we would not be so offended by everything, that we would choose to love people. I pray that you would fill this room with your Holy Spirit, that as we encounter you, as we move forward, that, that we would hear you speak to us. I pray you would reveal things to people. I pray people in this room would find breakthrough. There'd be freedom in this room as we release that forgiveness. Have your way in this place. Here we pray, amen. Amen, let's respond to the Holy Spirit this morning, to his leading, and let's forgive. As I, as I think about this idea of unforgiveness, I have this thought of unforgiveness, that unforgiveness for many people is an idol in their life. You might be saying like an idol, right? We think of the Bible where they have these idols set up in worship. But I think for a lot of us, unforgiveness can become an idol. It's something that we're constantly looking at and we're living our life based off of that unforgiveness, based off of that offense that happened to us. And when that unforgiveness is elevated to that position that only God should have, it blocks us from receiving from God what he has available to you. I believe that it can block you from receiving the Holy, that it can block you from healing. It can block you from all sorts of stuff. We have to learn to forgive because forgiveness gives you freedom. You wanna be free, you need to forgive. And now that we've walked through this moment, where I hope that you were able to walk through some forgiveness you, you maybe had some unforgiveness in your heart and you walked through that a little bit. I wanna give you a moment where maybe you need to forgive yourself. And maybe you need to have a moment where your guilt is leading you to a place of repentance. What is repentance? It's turning away from the world. It's turning away from sin. It's turning away from myself and turning back to God. And you're saying there's some things in my life that I've done, some guilt that I have, and I want to repent. I wanna give up those things and I wanna follow Jesus. That's you with your heads bowed, eyes closed. That's you and you'd say, I need to repent, I need to forgive myself. Would you just raise your hand saying, that's me. God, forgive me. See your hands, hands up all over. Maybe, maybe this is the first time and, and you have yet to have a relationship with Jesus and you wanna receive salvation, you wanna receive the gift that he had. If that's you this morning, you wanna begin a relationship with Jesus, would you just raise your hand? saying, I wanna begin that relationship, I see you. If you're online, if, if you're at home, wherever you're at, you can just raise your hand, just show it. It's not about me, it's about you and God right now. God, I thank you for every hand that was raised in this moment, for those turning from sin, turning back to you. I thank you for the forgiveness, the freedom that is being had in this room. For those that are walking through forgiving someone else, I pray if it's someone at work, that when they get to work tomorrow, they would forgive. If it's someone that they need to call when they get home, that they would do it right away, that they wouldn't sit on it, but we would act on it quickly. 
pray that as you speak to us, that we would listen and we would act on that, that we would obey your word. We thank you for those hands that went up of repentance, turning from sin, turning back to you. We celebrate that. We thank you for the forgiveness you gave us that you showed us through Christ. And we pray that we'd be able to show that to everyone around us. In your name we pray.